can, can affect later uh, health in adulthood. So the evidence for early nutrition in humans affecting later health is provided by observational epidemiological studies where they have used markers of in utero nutrition as birth weight and looked at outcomes later on or also from some experimental uh, studies where interventions were done, done early on and they looked at outcomes in long-term follow-up. These studies basically are more so in preterm infants rather than in term infants. And recently in term infants and term SGA infants, some randomized trials have been published where they have looked at the effect of early nutrition on risk of obesity in childhood. So um, I actually already mentioned they are looking for marker of in utero nutrition as birth weight and nutrition uh, during the neonatal period and infancy, the postnatal growth is taken as a marker of nutrition. So Dr. Simmons actually mentioned all these three studies. Basically, there's a Dutch famine cohort that looked at effects of in utero nutrition on outcomes in adulthood, and then the Barker epidemiological studies that resulted in the Barker hypothesis and confirmation on low birth weight association with non-insulin dependent diabetes in the nurses cohort study. I just want to point out one thing, depending on the period of um, decreased nutrition in utero, if the exposure was like the, it, the pregnancy was exposed early in gestation, the infants were not small. They were not born SGA, however, there was increased incidence of coronary heart disease in, these, uh, in this population. When the famine cohort study, the exposure to the famine was in mid-gestation, there was increased incidence of airway disease and microalbuminuria. While in late gestation, the infants were SGA and they had import, uh, impaired glucose tolerance. Now, um, where SGA infants are concerned, recently there are some studies showing effect of rapid growth early on and then outcomes later. And recently there was a study published where it looked at young adults and reported that rapid growth in the first three months was associated with central adiposity, reduced insulin sensitivity, and un unfavorable lipid profiles. And one randomized study has been published in SGA infants suggesting faster weight gain in infancy is associated with greater fat mass in childhood. And this may lead to later insulin resistance and obesity in these infants. Where uh, this basically raises the effect of early postnatal nutrition, which is designated as catch-up growth in SGA infants, and this may lead to increased risk of adult onset disease. The interaction between the birth size and later growth should be considered. This is also called the mismatch hypothesis or the thrifty phenotype hypothesis, where the fetus adapts to the unfavorable nutritional environment in utero, and when exposed to overnutrition postnatally, has adverse outcomes uh, during later life. Where term AGA infants are concerned, slower rates of growth are reported in breastfed infants compared to formula fed infants. Breastfeeding has also been reported to be protective against obesity insulin, and insulin-dependent diabetes. Now, rapid weight gain in observational studies have also been reported to increase the risk of later obesity. In the study that, that is shown over here, basically this was uh, data collected on about 4,000 German children about five to six years old, and they looked at their weight gain percentiles in the first two years of life and showed as the percentile of weight gain increases, the incidence of overweight 
increased at five to six years, show, showing that maybe these children, because they were overweight at five to six years, puts them at higher risk of obesity and insulin, sens uh, insulin resistant later in life. The most sensitive window during infancy when rapid growth can affect and increase the risk of obesity later in life is not known. There are studies reporting that it is related to the increased weight gain in the first three months. There are reports with increased weight gain in the first six months, and then there are reports up to a year. Anyway, in observational studies, any, uh, another thing that has been reported is that the protein intake has been associated with early greater growth. To test this hypothesis, a multi-center double-blind study was conducted by the European Childhood Obesity Trial Study Group, where they randomized full-term AGA infants whose either their mothers elected that they were not going to breastfeed these infants, or within the first eight weeks of life, the Ba the children were on formula completely, so the infants could be enrolled in the studies for up to first eight weeks of life. So they were randomized to a low protein group shown here in the dashed line. The uh, high protein group, high protein formula group, or they also had a control observational breastfed infants and they followed them for two years. The low protein formulas provided a protein a concentration approximately of 1.25 to 1.6 grams, which is equivalent to generally the term formulas that are being used currently in most countries. Um, the high protein formula provided about 2.2 to 3.2 grams per 100 ml. These are more formulas that are used actually as post-discharge enriched formulas for preterm infants and are not likely to be used for term infants. However, they did this to look as a proof of concept to prove the hypothesis that higher protein intake early in life could be associated with adiposity. So the weight, the length, weight for length and the BMI are shown here for three, six, 12, and 24 months. They generally started with about 500 infants in each group when the study started at about eight weeks. And by the time the study was finished, they had approximately 300 to 325 infants in each group. As you can see, the infants who were randomized to the higher protein intake, they had higher weight at three, six, and 12 months, it, there, was no, there was really not a significant difference here at 24 months. There was no difference in the length in the three groups, but when they looked for the weight for length, the infants who were in the high protein formula group had higher weight for length at six, 12, and 24 months. Similarly, the BMI was higher at three, six, and 24 months. They suggested that the, the, the mechanism was that the higher protein supply resulted in increased insulin re releasing amino acids that resulted in higher insulin and IGF-1 levels, which caused increase in weight gain and adipose tissue. They actually, in a sub-study, they looked at some of these infants in all three groups and measured and determined their fat-free mass and fat mass by isotope dilution methods and compared it to the weight gain velocity in the first six months. This, these measurements were done at six months and showed that as the weight gain velocity of these infants increased, the fat mass increased. Also, the weight gain velocity of infants who were in the higher protein group was significantly greater than the weight gain velocity of the other two groups. They also correlated 
the fat mass is six months and showed that it predicted the BMI at 24 months, suggesting the possible role of protein intake in programming obesity risk in these infants. Before I go into, uh, for preterm infants, I do want to say, infants who are fed breast milk are definitely shown to be smaller than infants who are fed formula. Whether it has anything to do with protein intake, I'm not sure, because actually in this study, there was no difference between the low protein and the breastfed infants. However, something that has not been looked at and studied is the control of appetite. When babies are breastfed, they regulate their intake, while when babies are formula fed, the regulation of intake is highly dependent on the caretaker. And it, the tendency is to try and finish whatever is in the bottle. How this affects development of appetite later in life and contribute to the obesity and the, and the uh, morbidity that is associated with obesity is not known. Now, what is the evidence of programming of early nutrition in preterm infants? Some of the evidence is provided by nutritional ent interventions that were done on these infants early in the postnatal life, and these infants was followed for a longer period of time. Most of the evidence comes from studies by Lucas and his group, and uh, where they enrolled preterm infants and randomized the ones who were not being provided with express breast milk, the mothers elected to, to not breastfeed these infants, to either a standard term formula or a preterm formula. And infants who were uh, breastfed, if the mother was not able to provide adequate amount of breast milk, the supplements were provided either with the term formula or with the preterm formula. This is just to give you an idea of concept of a low nutrient diet and a higher nutrient diet. They followed these infants at seven to eight years and looked at their neurodevelopmental outcome and showed particularly in males, overall IQs were significantly higher in the in infants who were on the enriched group compared to the standard group. And also the verbal IQs were significantly higher in the infants fed the enriched formulas or the enriched formula as a supplement to EBM. The neurocognitive impairment defined as IQs less than 85 and or CP was significantly higher in the infants who were not fed the non-enriched diets. They brought back a cohort, which whoever they could get to come back at 13 to 16 years and looked, studied insulin resistant using 32, 33 split pro insulin product as a marker of insulin resistance and showed that the, they also had a group of um, term AGA infants uh, of similar age as a control. And they showed the infants who were fed the high nutrient diet had significantly higher split pro-insulin levels compared to the low nutrient diet, suggesting they, the infants on the high nutrient diet may have or were prone to insulin resistance. However, I do want to point out there was no difference between the term controls and the high nutrient diet. They, this was based on the nutrient intake, so they tried to look to see whether rates of growth, postnatal rates of growth in these infants in any way correlated with the insulin resistance. They looked at growth at different periods and found there was no significant effect of any period other than the first two weeks of life. And basically showed that if infants gained weight in the first two weeks of life, if they were losing weight, generally the, the pro-insulin split products were on the lower side, but if they gained weight, 
they had higher pro-insulin products and that maybe they were more prone to insulin resistance in later in life. They also studied flow-mediated endothelial-dependent dilation in these infants at 13 to 16 years. They are not infants. They are now 13 to 16 years old. And this gives them an indication of cardiovascular health and showed that the flow-mediated dilation was significantly higher when they were uh, in the low-weight gain group compared to the high-weight gain group suggesting that these infants were maybe at higher risk of cardiovascular uh, problems. However, I do again want to point out there was no difference in the high weight gain group and the control group. So where preterm infants are concerned, any potential advantage of slow growth must be balanced against the adverse effect of undernutrition on the brain. Based on the current available data at age 13 to 16 years, preterm infants fed enriched diets during the neonatal period had no greater risk of cardiovascular disease and insulin resistance later in life compared to children born at term. Um, some of the proposed mechanism of early nutrition leading to programming has been shown from animal models where nutritional stress has been shown to alter apoptotic hemostasis by altering the expression of certain proteins. Also, nutritional stress may involve epigenetics, and this was so eloquently explained by the two speakers earlier today. So, in a summary, the risk of obesity and morbidities, basically metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, and other diseases that are associated with obesity is dependent on the genes and the environment. And the environment, when nutritional, can, be, can affect during in utero, we could be fetal overnutrition, which would be associated with maternal, maternal obesity, high pregnancy weight gain, and gestational diabetes, which would lead to some programming and placing the infant at a higher risk for obesity, diabetes, etc. Fetal undernutrition uh, also would, in, in condition where the ma ma there was maternal nutritional imbalance or placental dysfunction, would lead to SGA infants and then with Increased rapid growth postnatally lead to mismatch hypothesis and increase the risk again for this phenotype. I should point out, which Dr. Hansen very eloquently pointed out, that nutrition might play a significant role even pre-pregnancy period and might contribute and increase the risk for this phenotype. In postnatal nutrition after birth, accelerated postnatal growth hypothesis ha has been shown that the lack of short breastfeeding, overfeeding, excessive protein intake may increase the risk of obesity and the metabolic syndrome phenotype in, in adulthood. I will end here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Keshab. Thank you very much for this comprehensive review. Uh, actually, this is a very... Uh, um, a burning question for all of us neonatologists, how to feed those babies, how much is uh, too much, but we will come to that in the question session. Thank you very much.